Welcome to BP Online. We're a church that meets in North Central Calgary with people from all over the world, from all different walks of life, and we're excited you're joining us today. We hope that as you watch online, you're encouraged and challenged in your faith, and most of all, that you encounter Jesus. If you're checking us out for the first time, welcome. You're in the right place at the right time. Whether you're watching us at home or on the go, we hope you'll be impacted by the service today. Thanks for joining us. We will be starting in just a few moments. Welcome to church this weekend, everybody. We're so glad you're joining us. If you're joining us online, welcome as well. I invite you to stand and let's worship.
Amen. God is so good. He's here tonight because he wants to give us freedom. I want to welcome you tonight to today to BP Church. So glad whether you're online or here in the building that you can join us. We want to thank you today for coming today. And we want to be so excited today because Pastor Mark is bringing the word from Acts 15. And he's going to be talking all about conflict. So if you've got conflict tonight, you are in the right place. Because the Bible tells us how to deal with it. Amen? Amen. All right. We're going to teach you a new song this weekend. And uh, how many of you know that the joy of the Lord is our strength? Yes? All right. Well, we're going to declare that in this place. Here we go. God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. Sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still holds the the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise sing that out
rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on
with us. Lord God, you are our king. Father, it says in your word that you own cattle on a thousand hills, Father. All power, all authority, Lord God, has been given to you by the Father. So in Jesus' name today, we just pray for miracles in this house, Lord God. Father, every need would be met, Lord God. There be no lack in your home, Lord God, for you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. Father, you have conquered every foe in Jesus' name. So, Lord, today we proclaim your victory in your house. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming today. We're here to celebrate. We're here to rejoice and be glad. Pastor Mark. Am I on? Yeah, I am. Uh, we want to celebrate some special people this week, and you can be seated. Uh, we want to celebrate our grads. If you've graduated from grade 12 uh, or college uh, this last little while, we want to celebrate you and honor you. So if you're a grad, come on up. We have any grads in Osoleil? You're here. We have any other grads here this weekend? Come on in. Come on in. Awesome, awesome. I thought we had one more, one more. No? Awesome. All right, let's find out where'd you graduate from. Introduce yourself. Where'd you graduate from and future? Yeah, my name is Josh. I'm uh, graduating from UFC with biological sciences, and I'm heading off to master's in physiotherapy at McMaster. Nice, at McMaster? Yeah. Oh, good for you, Soleil. I'm Soleil. I graduated from grade 12. I'm going to go to Mount Royal for youth and child care counseling. Very good. Congratulations. Uh, Michaela was here. We have a couple of books for you. I believe this one's for you. And Soleil, this one's for you. And uh, we're going we're gonna to pray for you guys. And uh, just see the Lord launch you into your future. Oh, you graduated too? Okay. Well, tell us. Uh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> My name is Georgette Tieba. I'm just uh, graduated from a master in counseling psychology from Athabasca University. Congratulations! <laughs> and we have another book for you. We're prepared for those that we didn't know. <laughs> we're we're going to be here tonight. Well, we want to pray for you guys, and, and Ben is going to pray for you now. Now, typically we get Ben to pray because you know, they're graduating high school or college and they're going into the young adults ministry. But maybe I should uh, haul someone else up to pray too. But uh, you're probably not going to go to the young adults ministry, but they might be coming to you. <laughs> but anyway, Bren, why don't you pray for us and pray for our grads and yeah, congratulations, absolutely. everyone. So Jesus, we just, we thank you for this time of celebration. We yeah. thank you for just the gift of education and, and that, that we get to participate in education. And God, I just pray that these, these years of education, these years of learning wouldn't go to waste, but we'd use them not only for our own life or our own advancement, but to advance your kingdom, God, that uh, we would be using our education to glorify you every single day. And so God, for the grade 12 grads and, and for those who have graduated post-secondary, we just pray that you would guide them on what's next, God, that you would it says that your word is a lamp onto my feet. And so, Lord, we just ask that that be true today, that you would be an amazing guide for our grads today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Congratulations again. You may be seated. You may stand up, say hi to somebody around you. Our junior high class is dismissed uh, out to the gym. We have a junior high class if you're visiting, and uh, you can send your children out there. Get to know somebody, and we have some announcements coming right up for you. Well, hey everybody, it's Brandon here. I want to welcome you to BP Church, especially if you're new with us. We have a connecting card in the seat back in front of you, and we would love for you, if you're willing, just to take a few moments during the service and fill out as much information as you feel comfortable giving us, and take it to the Take 3 booth, because we want to connect with you. Uh, the Take 3 booth is we ask you to test drive our church for three weeks and see if it's a good fit for you. We're going to put a little gift in your hand. We're going to answer some of your questions, give you some information, and just welcome you. We're so thankful that you decided to join us this weekend, and we would love to connect with you after the service. 
And for those parents here who have little ones, we just want to let you know that we do have a nursery for you if your son or daughter is not quite feeling it in the sanctuary. Um, there is a nursing mother's room, there is a staffed place where you can drop your kid off, and there's also a little room there if you just want to watch your kid play and you can watch the service at the same time. It's all there for you and we want to make sure that you know about it. Well, the only announcement that we have this weekend is just a reminder that our kids ministry is hosting their pool party and their kids camps and they're filling up fast. And so if you have little ones and you want them to be a part of that, make your way to bpchurch.ca slash kids and you can register for them, not register for them. Well, actually you have to register for them unless they're super hackers, I guess, uh, and get them a part of those programs. Well, church, those are all the announcements that we have for this weekend. Today we are continuing our series in the book of Acts, and so Pastor Mark will be speaking. So this time, would you put your hands together and welcome Pastor Mark. I wanted to bring this to your attention. Of course, uh, Canada Day is coming up, and we've put together a prayer guide for you for Canada Day. We'd love you to take an hour just to set aside an hour to pray for our country, pray for what God wants to do and what he's doing and what he's going to continue to do. And we put this together for you. It's on our app. Also, you can download it there. Or it's also on our, our website under resources, and you can download it from there. Or we have it out printed. We have the old-fashioned printed copy if you'd like to take that home with you this weekend. But I encourage you for July the 1st to take some time and just pray for our country. Boy, I believe, I strongly believe that prayer is what changes everything. And I truly believe when God said to them as they dedicated the temple, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear I will hear and I will respond. And when we pray, God responds. And God, God answers that when we pray. And so I believe we just need to intercede on behalf uh, of our country and just to see God do what he needs to do in our country. Well, we're going to take a look at Acts chapter 15 tonight. And uh, Acts chapter 15 is all about conflict. Anybody ever had conflict in your life? If you haven't, you will. It's a guarantee. We always will face conflict of one type or another. And you might this week go into conflict. You might find a, a situation where you disagree adamantly with somebody else. And it doesn't take long to look at the news and find conflict in our country, in other countries around the world. You will find people disagreeing and fighting about the difference of opinion that they have. Right? It's what it basically boils down to. Well, in this passage of Scripture, you've got a, a corporate conflict, and then you have a personal conflict. I'm, I'm just bouncing right back at me up here, so if we can uh, take that echo out, that'd be great. <clears throat> I'd like you to hear me. I just don't like hearing myself. Uh, con conflict, in, in this passage of Scripture, you've, it starts off with a corporate conflict. So what has happened in Acts chapter 15, it's a little bit larger, so I'm going to give you just a breakdown real quick of what happens in 15. You, you've got the early church in, in Jerusalem, and then other individuals, Gentiles, getting saved all around the area, and some individuals from the Jerusalem church go out to the Antioch church, and in the Antioch church, they begin to tell these Gentiles that have gotten saved that they need to be circumcised. And so there becomes this conflict about do they really need to be circumcised or do they not need to be circumcised? And, and the people that had went out from the Jerusalem church weren't actually sent out by the leaders in the Jerusalem church. They just took it upon themselves to go tell the other churches what they thought the other churches needed to do. Now, back it up just a little bit and so you can get a better contextual thought about this is that the individuals that first came to understand who Jesus is were Jewish individuals. They understood that Jesus is the Messiah that their faith had talked about for thousands of years, that had been prophesied about, that, that had been told that he was going to come and he was going to be their deliverer, he was going to be their savior. And they understand, they come to faith believing that Jesus is not just that physical savior, but he's that spiritual savior that God desired for them, that was now bringing them into to this new relationship, this new covenant relationship with God. Well, these Jewish individuals didn't all of a sudden just drop all their old traditions. They actually kept most of their old traditions, 
because it was part of their faith expectation. The Jewish individuals were waiting for a Messiah. Then they still are for those that haven't understood who Jesus is. But then when they understood who Jesus is, it naturally fit into their old construct of their relationship with God. They were still covenant people with God. And because they were in this covenant, there was things that were required in the covenant for them to follow. So when they accept Christ into their life, they added that to the old covenant. It was just simple for them. But now you've got these individuals that were outside of this covenant that, they, that God had made with his people, the Gentiles, those that weren't Jewish, that were coming to faith in who Jesus is. And they were looking at them going, well, they've got to now do this other stuff too to really be under this covenant promise that God had made with the Jewish people. So you see Peter and you see uh, Paul and you see the early church wrestling with this as they're going through growing up as the early church. So individuals in the, in the early church in Jerusalem went out into the surrounding areas and, and what was happening is the church had grown exponentially and it no longer was it just the apostles giving leadership. There was now elders and, and those that had grown up in the church that were actually taking it on themselves to go out and evangelize and to teach and, and, and all of this, which is good. We want that in the church. But they had went out without an understanding of what the leadership in the early church was really wrestling with. So now all of a sudden, there's a conflict. Because they've went out and told the Gentiles that have gotten saved that you need to do these things. And all of a sudden, they start talking to Peter and Paul and, and Barnabas and all of the other apostles. This word comes back of, hey, individuals have went out. They've told the Gentiles this. Is this what the Gentiles must do to have relationship with God and to be in this covenant that we understand that we're in? And so what happens is there's a conflict in the entire church. The whole early church is now one side or the other of this issue. And so the issue then comes to the apostles, comes to the council in Jerusalem, and the council hears it, discusses it, and sees what the Holy Spirit has to say about it. So in Acts chapter 15, 1 through 41, we see this unfold. And then at the end of it, we see a personal conflict that arises between Paul and Barnabas. So there's this corporate conflict, and then there's this personal conflict. So how do you resolve conflict? How do you resolve conflict when it arises in your life, whether it be in an entire family, an entire friend group, an entire workplace, or between two individuals? Well, first of all, I believe that you isolate the issue. You just isolate the issue. Really, what is driving this conflict? What's the thing behind this? Not, not just all the other things that are contributing to it, but what's the one or two thing that is making this conflict to arise in my life? And in the early church, it was this understanding, again, getting the, con the, uh, the concept of the mindset of the Jewish individuals of they've done all of these things all of their life to have community and to be in covenant with God. And now they see others coming into relationship with their God through Jesus, who they understand is the Messiah. And these individuals, how can they truly be in covenant without doing all the other things that we've had to do all of our life? And so the conflicts arise in, in, in that, hey, for us to truly be together as one, you have to do everything that we've always done. So in Acts chapter 15, verse 10, we see, now then why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Now the response to the individuals is, why are you trying to make others do the things you couldn't even do? Now outside of Jerusalem, the further away you got from Jerusalem, the, lay, the, the less they followed the religious rules. So as you moved out from Jerusalem, there was less of the stuff followed. Now, circumcision was followed probably all throughout, but it even began to die off at this point. 
He goes on, he says, why are you trying to make everyone else try to do the things that even our own ancestors couldn't do? No, we believe that it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as you are. We're saved through grace. We're not saved through these rules and regulations. We're saved through grace. Now, Paul again says this to the Ephesians church when he says, for it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. It is not from ourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that anyone could boast about what you have done to be in that relationship with God. Paul reinforces this to the early church, saying that it's saved by grace. It's just by what Jesus has done for us. It's only through what Jesus has done for us, not something you could do on your own. And Paul even expands this a little bit more. And in Romans chapter 2, he, he talks to the Romans church and he says, a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly only. It's not about the outward expression or the things that you can do, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is circumcision of the heart. It's a transformation on the inside that God wanted to do. It wasn't an outside thing. Even in the beginning, when God gave the rules and the laws to the children of Israel, he said, one day, I'm going to write these on your heart. One day, it's going to be inward. It's not just going to be the things you do on the outside. It's going to be what takes place in here. Now, this is so important. And actually, even in our world today, we see a little wrestle with this. Uh, he says, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So when it comes to understanding what's going on in conflict, you first isolate the issue. You have to dig through some layers sometime. So you had to dig through this one to go, well, you know what? You've got a whole group of people here that believe that covenant with God comes this way. And Jesus is the Messiah on top of that. And then you have this understanding that this was the old covenant, but there's a new covenant that Jesus made that is totally by grace, totally by what he did on the cross, not what you can do in yourself. And so when they put these two together, now the two are, are like, how does this work? And as they sort through the layers, they come down to this understanding, okay, it is by grace. So if it's by grace, what does that mean for us now? How do we make a decision going forward of what this is going to look like if we're going to live in community together? Because you see, when, when, when conflict arises, even Jesus addresses this and, uh, when he talks in Matthew chapter 18. He says, when you're, when you're at odds with each other, he, he says, go to each other individually and individually talk about what's going on. If you can't resolve it individually, bring somebody along with you. Help that, have that person to in the conversation to maybe help you discover what the problem is. If that doesn't work, then get more leaders in the church to come alongside. If that doesn't work and there's going to be conflict and there's an individual causing the conflict, ask the individual to leave. But he says, isolate the issue and go down deeper until you can get to the core thing. In this instance, it was community trying to wrestle about how do we live together? How do we live together when we've never lived together before? You've got a Jewish community that is never associated with the Gentile community. And now you've got the Gentile community coming into the Jewish community. And the two are just trying to figure out how do we do life together? How do we go to church together? How do we sit down and do communion together? How do, how do we have the conversation about who God is if we're so different? So the early church had to sit down, isolate the issue, and then they had to make a decision of what it was going to be for them to go forward. It said, they said, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Now, this just seems simple, but if you look at this little, little verse, it says it's good to the Holy Spirit. So number one is they sought counsel. And the first counsel they seek is God. They sought, God, what do you want to do in this circumstance? 
a lot of times when we're in conflict, we get so frustrated in the conflict that all we do is say, God, fix that person. Right? It's like, God, would you just show them? And we're not actually consulting God. We're actually asking God to intervene in something we haven't even heard his voice on yet. Because maybe he would come along and say, well, Mark, it's, you're the problem here. You're the issue. You're the thing that's causing this to move in the direction it's going or keeping it from being resolved because you won't change your mind. You know, conflict, resolving conflict is not about finding a winner or a loser. And, and, and if you resolve conflict that way in your own life, you will always lose. You never win when you're the winner in conflict. Right? Right? Resolving conflict is about relationship building. It's about restoration. It's about resolve. It's not about being right. Resolving conflict is to build relationship. And in this case, it was to build the unity in the church. It was to build the community and bring them together. Now he goes on and he says, and it, was, it was good to God and it was good to others. And so they consulted God and they talked about it amongst themselves. They brought someone else into the conversation. They didn't exclude everybody else. They said it was good to God and it was good to us. We understood what God was saying to us and everybody worked through the situation to come up with a solution. He goes on, he says, you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood and from meat and of strangled animals, from sexual immorality. You will do good to, you will do well to avoid these things. Now, these things were important to the early community. There was a number of things. There were some health issues in this, but there was also the food sacrificed to idols. When they took food sacrificed to idols in the context of the community of the day, it was a sense of idolatry in that they were eating what was sacrificed to an idol or a, a deity or a god that they believed in. And when they ate the food, they were taken in the deity. That was the idea of eating food sacrificed to an idol. So in this case, it was idolatry. It was idol worship to do that. So they said, you know, since everybody, and if you read this passage, it says, you know, these things have been taught in all of these communities about the Jewish faith, that we don't do this thing. We don't eat food sacrificed to other idols in, in saying that we believe in that idol. So in the community, for the betterment of the community, think about somebody other than yourself. Don't eat the food sacrificed to idols. Now, this opens up a whole can of worms. And, and I can even tie it into today in, in, our, in our North American context. So here we go. You ready for this? I bet you some of you are wondering, is pastor going to touch this this weekend? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 tells us this. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have right to do anything but I will not be mastered by anything. I have the right for anything in my life, you say. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Paul goes on further in 1 Corinthians, and he says this, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? This is the important thing to grab. Paul says, rhetorically, I have the right to do anything. It's my body. I can do what I want with my body. But then Paul goes on to explain this. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not. You are not your own. 
If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've asked him into your life, if you've accepted his grace, you are not your own. Your body is not your own. Just let it sink in. This applies in every area of life, whether you're male or female. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So when we say, well, it's my right to do, no, it's not. If you're a believer in Jesus, it's not. You have no choice. If it doesn't honor God, if Jesus wouldn't sit right beside you and say, go do that, it's not your choice. If you're not a believer in Jesus, it's your body. Do whatever you want. Eventually, God holds us to account for that. But if you are a believer, therefore, honor God with your bodies. It's all of our actions. So in the early church, it was, hey, yeah, maybe you can do that, and it's not going to bother you, but... Honor God so it's not bothering somebody else. In Galatians chapter 2, he says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Now, if we truly believe the faith that we profess, these are key passages of Scripture for us to understand in every struggle that we face. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. So it's not my decisions. It's God's decision. No matter what it is. I have been crucified with Christ. No longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself for me. And I do the same for him. I read a book last year called Cruciformity, and it was all about Paul's teaching and some of Peter's teaching on what it means to die to self. In our North American context, we we really don't get it. Die to self. What's it mean for me to discipline this thing so that it's no longer I that lives but Christ that lives through me. What does that look like? From desires to responses to people to thinking I deserve whatever I deserve, all of that stuff. It's no longer I that live, the Christ that lives in me. You say, well, yeah, but that was Paul teaching, and that was, that was Peter teaching, and that, this is the early church. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Foundational passages to the Christian faith. No longer me that lives, but him that lives in me. Jesus says, if you really want to be my disciple, be a follower of me, you will do what I did. You'll take up a cross. You'll die to self and live for others. You'll die to self And live for someone else. And your body will be a witness to that. That I die to self and I live for others. See, resolving conflict is get to those issues first. And in our own life, the conflict might be between me and God. The conflict might be between me and Holy Spirit convicting me of the things that this body should not be doing. Or that this mind should not be involved in. Or the actions that should not exist in a believer in Jesus Christ. 
The conflict might be that I need to look at myself and just say, Holy Spirit, what would be good to you? What would be good to you? How should I respond in this circumstance? How should I respond in this area? How can I encourage someone else and not worry about myself? You see, in in conflict, it goes from the real issue, and then it goes to personal preference. In resolving conflict, we go into that personal preference, and and in the first part, it was a community thing. It was a huge community thing. The second part, it's actually between two individuals. And, And sometimes conflict is bigger, and it's like, yeah, we're just part of a big crowd that is yelling back and forth at each other. Or then it gets real personal, and it's, a good friend. In this case, it's a mentor and a mentee. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 36, Paul and Barnabas are at odds because Barnabas wants to take John Mark or Mark with them on their next missionary trip. They're about to leave this area and, and go back to all the churches that they've been to and minister to them again and bring correction and encourage them. Just like it happened in Antioch, they figured, you know what, we should go back to these other churches just to make sure things are going well. And as they look at it, they're like, okay, well, what are we going to do? And who needs to go with us? And, and Paul did not think it was wise to take Mark with them because he had deserted them earlier on. You know, sometimes we get an opinion of somebody because of their past actions, right? Typically, that's how our opinions are are formed about people, is the things they've done and the things they haven't done. It even happens around here when we're talking about doing things and getting people to help and do things, and and, and an A might come up, and you know what, if that person in the past has, you know what, not dropped the ball and has been there on time and has followed through with their commitments and everything else, like, yeah, man, that person, if you give them something to do, they're going to get it done. Other names might come up. It's like, yeah, I don't know, man. They, didn't, they, have a, they have a tendency of not following through. And if you overcommit and underproduce, you get this tendency of not following through, and eventually people stop asking you to do, right? A lot of you are looking down. I'm not talking about anybody in the room, honestly. Like, you're all awesome. <laughs> But it's the, in this case, it's the overpromise and underproduce. And Paul and Barnabas are at odds about this, and they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and left. And the, and the community committed them to the Lord's work and, and what they were supposed to do. It's interesting because... If you have followed the story of Paul and Barnabas, who brought Paul into the church? Barnabas. Nobody trusted Paul. The leadership were worried about Paul. They thought, "Mm, he's like a sheep in wolf's clothing, or he's a a wolf in sheep's clothing. We can't trust this guy. Barnabas vouched for him. And Barnabas mentored him. Barnabas had this leadership grace on him. Where Barnabas would give people that second chance and that second opportunity or third, and, and, and he believed the best for people. Now, I can, as I read this, I, I understand these personalities, and you can see the, the different personalities coming out in the conversation. Barnabas is somebody that will come alongside of you and walk with you and help you, and, and mentor you, and be there in those moments that you, you really need someone to lift you up. Paul, on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with him, except Paul, on the other hand, will say, hey, I'm running a marathon. You want to come? And as he's saying it, he's going, and he's expecting you to jump in with him. This was what Paul's passion was. Paul's passion was to get to the entire world that he knew with the gospel of Jesus as quick as he could. He had to do it. He was compelled, 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 compelled to go, 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 go. 
Something happened in their journey that Mark was like, hey, I, I'm out for a bit. I got, I got some commitments I got to take place over here. And, and Barnabas was probably like, okay, yeah, we'll catch you later. And Paul was like, ah, oh, you idiot, and kept going. It's basically what happened. And at this point, Barnabas is like, yeah, Mark can come with us. And Paul's like, are you kidding me? He left us. I can't trust him. I got to run, man. I need somebody that can run with me. And Barnabas is like, yeah, but I see value in him. He's awesome. We got to mentor him. We got to bring him along. Different personalities, different leadership styles. One, you might say, well, Barnabas is right and Paul is wrong. I wouldn't do that. You see, in resolving conflict, you got to understand the issue and you have to have grace. You have to have grace because in the grace, you begin to understand who the person is. I had a roommate in seminary. I don't think any of my old roommates watch uh, online, so I can say this. I had a roommate in seminary that, uh, man, he drove me nuts. I, 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 he was an extra grace required type of guy. And um, numerous times I just felt like letting him know he needed extra grace. But I took this class on personalities in a counseling class. And I began to understand this guy's a sanguine. And if you don't know what a sanguine is, well, I better not say it because you might be a sanguine. But anyway... I am not a sanguine. I am the exact opposite of a sanguine. And those two don't mix well. But when I began to understand that why his brain thought the way it thought, I liked him. Because I understood who he was. And then I had grace in those other areas that annoyed me. You see, Barnabas could understand the other layers, and I don't think Paul did, because Paul was a driver. He just had to go, 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 go. And sometimes it's as simple as that. The person you're in conflict with just has a different personality, and they approach life way different than you do, and you need to have grace for them. You just got to have grace. You got to look at them through who they are and know who they are. And then you can actually even work with them. Second Timothy verse four, or chapter four, verse one says, Paul later on calls out for Mark to come to be with him. He says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. At one point, having Mark with him literally divided him and his mentor. But I believe that as Paul grew up and as Paul began to understand and learn about different areas and people, Paul was then able to value somebody that he actually didn't value before. When it comes to resolving conflict, allow the Holy Spirit to teach you something new. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you revelation that you're not perfect. (laughs) Just let it drop in there. I know it's a surprise, first time anybody ever told you, but allow the Holy Spirit. Man, when I learned... This guy's personality, I was just like, oh, I've been such an idiot. He's not doing this on purpose. He's not trying to make me mad. It's just natural for him. (laughs) It's not his fault. And when you can, when that light goes on, you're like, oh, okay, I can, it's not tolerate. I actually can appreciate that about the individual. I can appreciate that's who they are, and that's how God made them. And I'm the one that needs to change. So in resolving conflict, isolate the issues. Make a decision. 
based on what the Holy Spirit is saying and counsel from others. Don't make it about personal preference. What you prefer and what somebody else prefers, it might not matter. It's personal preference. And understand when it's personal preference and when it's God saying something. There's a difference. There's biblical truth and personal preference. And the two aren't the same. Hopefully they're lining up. But biblical truth wins over personal preference. But when there's no biblical truth involved and it's just personal preference, it's just personal preference. And somebody can disagree with you and you can still love them because they have a different preference than you. (laughs) You'll never resolve conflict until you get that one. They can have a different preference than you and they're still great people. And then there's grace. We're saved by grace. It's all about grace. Barnabas had grace. I think Paul learned grace. I think probably the more Paul taught about grace, the more he learned grace. And later on, there was grace. But make sure that we add grace into our lives. Resolving conflict is not about winning. It's about the restoration of relationship. God desires us in relationship, in community. In the early church, that's what it was. There was a fracture in community. It was how do we bring this community back together? Well, these are the main things to focus on. In your life, maybe there's conflict and there's been no resolve because you can't win. Have grace. Have grace. And you'll resolve the conflict. Father, we thank you for your grace in our life. God, I just thank you that you love us so much that, Jesus, you would go to the cross for me. God, that you would send your son to die on the cross for my sin. It wasn't even his, it was mine. So that I could be restored to you. Father, help us to understand that we need to die to self so that you can live through us so that then we can actually live for others and not just for ourselves. Holy Spirit, convict us where we need to be convicted. Reassure us where we need that reassurance of your love and your grace still extended to us. And Lord, if there's anyone here or watching online right now, Lord, that doesn't have relationship with you, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll bring conviction where it's needed. You'll show them your grace and your love and the fact that you want to restore them to you. So, Holy Spirit, speak loudly into our lives right now. And as Pastor Mark sings this song, just listen to what Holy Spirit might have for you to take out of this message this weekend.
through your wisdom. Lord, if there's anyone watching or here right now that they just need you, they don't have that relationship that they can rely upon, God, I pray that you'll do what I can't do and you'll speak spirit to spirit right now, revealing yourself to them. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just as you're listening to the Holy Spirit right now, if you're here and you'd say, Mark, I, I need that relationship with God. I'm not in relationship with Him. I'm in actually in conflict with God right now. I want to give you an opportunity just to simply pray a prayer with me that would invite Jesus in and just say, Jesus, I believe in who you are and ask Him to forgive you of your sin. And if you're here in the room and that's you and I'm going to look at my right and your left, just before I pray the prayer, I'd like to know who would want to pray it with me. And if that's you, just look at me, my right and your left. And in the middle, if that's you today, and then over to my left and your right. Yeah. And online, there'll be a little button that comes up that says, I want to pray, I want to receive Jesus into my life. Just click on that. That just lets us know that you're praying this with us. And let's just simply pray this. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Fill me with your spirit. Empower me to live the life that you've created me for. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you just to keep your head bowed for a moment. And since we've been talking about conflict, uh, I just want to pray for you. If you're going through a time right now where you're in conflict, and you're seeking the Lord for that wisdom of how to resolve that conflict, I want to pray with you that the Holy Spirit is going to show you the things that need to be done and bring those alongside of you for the counsel you need and how to do it. And if that's you today, just quickly across the room again, just look at me on my right and your left. If you're, yeah, I'm in conflict right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the middle, is that you? Yeah. yeah and over to my left and your right. Father, I, I just pray for these individuals right now that are here and those watching online, God, that are in the middle of a conflict right now, whether it's of their own doing or someone else or whatever it might be. Father, I, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, you will give them wisdom. Holy Spirit, you will show them steps to take, changes they might need to make or the counsel they might need from others to be able to how to walk this out who needs to walk it with them to help them resolve this conflict? Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will bring resolve and you will restore relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand? I, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you and to our board. Last weekend, you guys honored Andrea and I and the girls and and uh, for being here for 10 years. And uh, I really should have honored you for putting up with me for 10 years, but uh, I like the other way around. It was great. Uh, but uh, I wanted to just say a big thank you uh, to all of you, the cards and the, the emails and the you know, gifts and just everything else. We just really did feel so honored uh, to be the pastor of this church or the lead pastors of this church. And uh, yeah, I just want to say a big thank you to you and our board. Our ministry team is going to be here at the front. If we can pray with you about anything, we would love to do that. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, and I truly pray that when you face conflict this week, that something in here, you'll go, okay, I need to isolate this issue. And then where do I go from here? I listen to the Holy Spirit, and he's going to give you direction as to how to resolve that issue in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks for watching. 
If you'd like more information about our ministry, visit bpchurch.ca. Have a great week and live the ultimate life.